Hello everyone and greetings from MedTube channel presenting another educational video on hyperkalemia. Now hyperkalemia is generally described as a serum potassium concentration above 5 milliequivalents per liter. Although some people say it is above 5.3, others say 5.4, others say 5.5, but we can all agree that it is above 5 milliequivalents per liter. And just like what we said in the previous video that more than 98% of the total body potassium is intracellular. And the three primary mechanisms by which hyperkalemia can result are exactly the opposite to the three mechanisms described in the hypokalemia video. And those three are the increased oral intake of potassium or increased release or shift of potassium out of the cells or decreased urinary excretion of the potassium. It is important to know that potassium disorders are more significant than the sodium disorders due to cardiac toxicity and that hyperkalemia is even more cardiac toxic than hypokalemia itself because of a higher risk of causing arrhythmia and cardiac arrest. But fortunately, hyperkalemia is less prevalent than hypokalemia. And finally, not forgetting to mention that in order to have a persistent hyperkalemia, you must have an impaired urinary potassium excretion due to a variety of different causes such as renal failure or aldosterone deficiency or other causes as we will be seeing later in the video. Great, now let's move to the etiology of hyperkalemia. And again, we have the three main categories. The first one is increased oral intake of potassium. The second is increased release from the cells. And the third is the decreased urinary excretion. So starting with the increased oral intake, although it is uncommon to have an isolated increased intake to cause hyperkalemia, but rather it is usually superimposed on another mechanism of hyperkalemia, such as increased release or decreased excretion of potassium. But nevertheless, there are a few examples which could trigger hyperkalemia, such as an IV bolus of potassium penicillin, especially in the infant's age, and there's the accidental ingestion of potassium-containing salt or the use of stored blood for exchange transfusion. And now coming to the increased release of potassium from the cells, starting with pseudo-hyperkalemia, which is not a true hyperkalemia, but rather hyperkalemia due to a flaw in the collection or the storage period. And it's usually due to a mechanical trauma during the venipuncture, causing hemolysis of the RBCs, or due to repeated fist clenching, causing release of potassium from the skeletal muscle cells. And now moving to metabolic acidosis. And the mechanism by which metabolic acidosis causes hyperkalemia is through the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump which exchanges potassium outside for hydrogen to be inside so that it buffers the pH, which is the exact opposite of what happens in alkalosis. Now please note that all the types of metabolic acidosis will have hyperkalemia except for the organic acidosis, which are the lactic acidosis and the ketoacidosis. And that's because the lactic acidosis and the ketoacidosis will enter the cells through other transporters other than the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. But please note that diabetic ketoacidosis actually does have hyperkalemia, but not because of the acidosis per se, but because of the insulin deficiency and the hyperosmolality associated with diabetic ketoacidosis and therefore causing hyperkalemia. And finally, we could also add respiratory acidosis, but because hyperkalemia is less pronounced in the respiratory acidosis, we have not included it in here. And now coming to the insulin deficiency, the hyperglycemia, and the hyperosmolality, all of which usually occur simultaneously in the setting of a diabetes mellitus, with insulin deficiency causing hyperkalemia through a decreased activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump, and hyperglycemia leading to hyperosmolality, both of which shift potassium and water out of the cells, causing hyperkalemia. But if you have a severe hyperglycemia and hyperosmolality, that will trigger osmotic diuresis and therefore could result in hypokalemia. And now reaching the increased tissue catabolism, which is basically cell lysis, releasing the major intracellular cation, which is of course the potassium, causing hyperkalemia. And it could be due to trauma, hemolysis, rhabdomyolysis, tumor lysis syndrome, due to chemotherapy or radiation therapy, or even a severe accidental hypothermia leading to cell lysis. But if you had the usual hypothermia, that would actually cause hypokalemia as described in the previous video due to the increased adrenergic activity. But in a severe accidental hypothermia, you will have cell lysis causing hyperkalemia. And now for the exercise. And in exercise, the exercising muscles will release potassium out of the cells due to the physiological role of potassium causing 
causing vasodilation to the exercising muscles. And the release potassium in exercise doesn't really enter the systemic circulation in large amounts, but rather stays mostly in the local exercising muscle causing the vasodilation. And now for hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, which is an autosomal dominant disorder, with very similar triggers to the hypokalemic periodic paralysis as described in the previous video, except that this one has hyperkalemia. And then we have the RBC transfusion, which causes hyperkalemia because the RBCs have leaked their potassium to the outside during the storage phase, which is the same one that I have mentioned right here, transfusion of stored blood, of which what I meant by is stored RBCs. But because you're giving the RBCs, you are giving the potassium, that's why I've included in the increased load or increased intake. But the exact mechanism of why there is hyperkalemia is actually increased release from the RBCs, and therefore I've also included it under this category, under the increased release from cells. And then finally coming to the drugs which cause hyperkalemia. Beginning with the beta blockers which cause hyperkalemia through three main mechanisms, all of which are due to the blockage of the beta-2 receptors. And the blockage of the beta-2 receptors will 1. decrease the sodium potassium ATPase pump activity, 2. decrease the activity of the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter, and 3. decrease the release of insulin, all of which cause hyperkalemia. And now coming to saxonylcholine. And saxonylcholine is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent. Therefore, it would cause depolarization of the neuromuscular junction along with blocking the receptors. This will result in release of potassium from the muscle. So usually that's not a problem, but in certain individuals who are predisposed to hyperkalemia, such as in trauma patients or burns patients, or those with prolonged immobilization and certain other conditions, you should be careful because of a possible hyperkalemia. And then we have digitalis. And digitalis inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase pump, just like the beta blockers, causing hyperkalemia. But of course, it's usually the toxicity that causes the hyperkalemia, not the normal serum doses of digitalis. And finally, we have arginine hydrochloride, which is used to treat metabolic alkalosis, as arginine hydrochloride is metabolized in part into hydrochloric acid, HCl, and arginine. HCl will treat the alkalosis, whereas arginine arginine will shift into the cells replacing the potassium and therefore potassium is kicked out of the cells to maintain the electron neutrality therefore causing hyperkalemia which is the same mechanism as aminocaproic acid which is used in acute bleeding disorders because aminocaproic acid is structurally similar to arginine and lysine and therefore it will shift into the cells as a cation and replacing the potassium and therefore causing hyperkalemia and please note there are a few other drugs that could also cause hyperkalemia such as diazoxide minoxidil and calcineurin inhibitors due to different mechanisms great so now let's Let's move to the last category which is decreased urinary excretion of potassium. Now in general, in order to have a normal potassium excretion in the kidneys, we need to have the following conditions. The first is we have a normal serum aldosterone levels, and the second is we have normal healthy kidneys, both to excrete the potassium and to have a normal response to the aldosterone, and third is to have the normal amounts of distal delivery of water and sodium, in which the sodium will be exchanged for potassium in the distal nephron, and therefore potassium excretion. So we need to have all of those components in order to have a normal potassium excretion, and any derangement of any of those will result in decreased potassium excretion and therefore we have the decreased aldosterone, aldosterone resistance, reduced distal delivery of water and sodium and finally we have the acute and chronic kidney disease. Any of those can result in the decreased urinary excretion. For decreased aldosterone we have several causes such as adrenal insufficiency, diabetic nephropathy or it could be a side effect of certain drugs such as the ACE inhibitors the ARBs, the angiotensin receptin blockers, the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or even calcium urine inhibitors, and there are other examples. For the aldosterone resistance, it is most commonly due to the potassium sparing diuretics, such as the aldosterone antagonist, spironolactone and eplerinone, or the luminal sodium channel blockers in the collecting tubules, which are amyloride and triamterene. Or aldosterone resistance could be due to the acute and chronic kidney disease itself, as we will see shortly. And now going for the reduced distal delivery of water and sodium, which is basically due to decreased effective 
effective circulating volume or effective arterial blood volume and the word effective means the blood volume which is actually reaching the body tissues for perfusion and therefore a decreased effective circulating volume is not necessarily due to a hypovolemic shock or decreased blood volume but it could be due to other causes such as in cardiogenic shock you have a normal blood volume but a decreased cardiac output and therefore the blood is not perfusing the tissues such as the kidneys and this will result in reduced distal delivery of the water and the sodium and finally we have the acute and chronic kidney disease and there are lots of mechanisms by which kidney disease or renal failure causes hyperkalemia but most commonly it is due to the oliguria causing decreased urinary excretion of potassium and due to the decreased secretion and responsiveness to aldosterone occurring in kidney disease in general but again there are other mechanisms that cause hyperkalemia and kidney disease in conclusion it is very important to understand that if you have acute hyperkalemia it is most commonly due to an increased release from cells whereas if you have a persistent hyperkalemia it is most commonly due to decreased urinary excretion of potassium fantastic we have just finished the etiology on hyperkalemia now let's move to the management of hyperkalemia and this time we're actually gonna have an exception we are not really starting with history taking but we are starting with an ECG it is very essential that you do an ECG as soon as possible because if you have ECG changes your management will be different and we are looking for the following ECG changes on the ECG the earliest sign in hyperkalemia is usually the hyper acute T waves as we can see on this ECG you can see how tall it is please note that the hyper acute T waves and hyperkalemia are thin and symmetrical they have a thin base and they are symmetrical. This is unlike the hyperacute T waves in MI, which is broad and asymmetrical. And if the hyperkalemia progresses, we can have more changes, such as the prolonged QRS complexes, more than three small squares, as we can see here. We have a wide QRS complex, and we can see the prolonged PQ interval. But the P wave is not really well appreciated in here because you have a flattened P wave in hyperkalemia and even absent P wave as in this ECG. We have an absent P wave. And the QRS complex is so wide that it's now called a sine wave because it literally looks now like a sine wave. And if the hyperkalemia further worsens, you will start to have heart blocks and bradycardias and finally resulting in cardiac arrests. And now back to the history taking, after we have done the ECG, we should exclude pseudo-hyperkalemia as previously explained due to errors during the collection and we ask the patient any history of diabetes mellitus and ask about the relevant points in history such as polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia and weight loss and ask about any history of hemolysis or whether any recent chemotherapy or radiotherapy received or any history of renal disease or any history of drug ingestion such as the beta blockers the digitalis the potassium sparing diuretics the ACE inhibitors the ARBs and the NSAIDs and then moving to the physical examination and we go for the cardiac auscultation assessing for any bradycardias or heart blocks and we examine for any ascending muscle weakness or paralysis and we assess for any paresthesias now to understand these symptoms let's have a look quickly on the pathogenesis of what hyperkalemia does so in hyperkalemia of course first your electrical gradient between the intracellular and the extracellular potassium is decreased and therefore in depolarization you will be having less potassium leaving the cells and subsequently you will have less hyperpolarization this results in the resting membrane potential being less negative and because your resting membrane potential is less negative you will need lesser action potential triggering the depolarization and therefore you will have increased muscle excitability with more and more depolarizations this will go on until your sodium channels become deactivated because of this persistent depolarization and therefore the sodium becomes less permeable and therefore you will have less sodium influx and your excitability will decrease resulting in less depolarizations and this is the primary pathophysiology behind the fatigue, the weakness, the paralysis, and the impaired cardiac conduction, resulting in various bradycardias and heart blocks, resulting usually in either ventricular fibrillation or asystole, giving cardiac rest. And now going back for the investigations, and the first thing we we'll look for is usually the GFR to assess for the renal function to include or exclude kidney disease or renal failure and usually if the GFR is normal that's when we order the 24 hours urine potassium and or the TTKG 
the transtubular potassium gradient because the results are more useful when we have a normal GFR. Nevertheless, it's always a good idea to have a full checkup on those patients, including all of the urinary electrolytes, the urinalysis looking for any evidence of kidney disease, CBC, metabolic profile, and the glucose level, and to check for the acid base status, with the glucose level and the acid base status more significant in the acute hyperkalemia, looking for any transcellular shifts. And finally, we move for the treatment of hyperkalemia. And the treatment has three components. The first one is to protect the heart, and the second component is to shift potassium into the cells, which is a temporary solution. And the third and the absolute treatment is to increase the potassium excretion, either through the urine, or through the GI, or through dialysis. Starting with protecting the heart, typically we use the IV calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. And usually we give the calcium when we have a serum potassium concentration above 7, regardless if we have any ECG changes or symptoms, or whenever we have ECG changes regardless of the serum potassium concentration. This is very essential to know. And you may also put the patient on continuous ECG, as if the patient has not responded in 5 minutes, you may repeat the administration of calcium. And the second component is to shift the potassium into the cells. And for that, we have three options. The first is regular insulin, and usually it's given with glucose to prevent hypoglycemia and this is the fastest way of bringing potassium into the cell the second is sodium bicarbonate to induce alkalosis and therefore shift more hydrogen ions out of the cells in exchange for potassium to go inside the cells and this decreases the hyperkalemia and the third is beta 2 agonist as ventilin which is either given nebulized or an IV form and the last one is to increase the potassium excretion and the first option is the loop or the thiazide diuretics which is the preferred approach the second option is cation exchange resins with the most commonly used one called sodium polystyrene sulfonate, commonly known as k exalate and it's quite interesting how this drug works. So from the name, the drug has sodium, and once you take the drug orally, the polystyrene sulfonate will release the sodium in the GI and get bound to the potassium in the bowel so that when the drug is excreted it will be mostly made of potassium polystyrene sulfonate and therefore it will decrease the hyperkalemia however this drug is not commonly preferred because of certain contraindications and side effects for example this drug should not be used in patients with constipation or ileus or in post-operative patients because of the ileus or in patients in opioids because of the ileus again and sorbitol should be avoided with this medication because of a possible intestinal necrosis which is a life-threatening condition therefore k exalate is usually left out for patients who are not responsive to the diuretics and the dialysis is not readily available then k exalate would be an appropriate option and the third option is dialysis especially in the renal failure patients or in a life-threatening hyperkalemia not responsive to the initial therapy these are the treatment options in summary so i really hope this video gives you an overall view on hyperkalemia thank you guys a lot for watching and hopefully i'll see you with the next video on metabolic acidosis